And we are live. Welcome, Mystery and Thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I'm so excited tonight to connect you with author David Corbett, who's here to talk to us about writing about the long-lost love letters of Doc Holliday and about anything else you want to ask him. David, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about these long-lost letters of Doc Holliday. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And um, the uh, back before I became a private investigator and before my job gave me more material than I knew what to deal with, I had to sort of look for things to be interested to write about, you know, before I actually decided to go into genre and go into crime. And one of the things that always fascinated me was the fact that Doc Holliday had kept up a lifelong correspondence with his cousin who ultimately became a nun. And not only was she a nun, but her name, she took the name Sister Melanie when she entered the Sisters of Charity. And the character Melanie from Gone with the Wind was based on her because Margaret Mitchell was related to the Holiday family. So that alone was fascinating. But the fact that one of the you know most notorious gunmen of the West had a lifelong correspondence with his cousin who was a nun with the suspicion that they might have been love letters, was just something that I thought, you know, someday I'm going to write about this. And I tucked away my research and it just sat there for years, you know, while I wrote about other things that, you know, concerned some of the cases I worked on and some other things. And finally, the, you know, it just was the, the idea that wouldn't go away. And so I decided to sort of make the letters a MacGuffin in a, uh, in a crime story. And basically, what if the letters weren't destroyed? Now, supposedly they were. And the story of that in, in itself is fascinating. I mean, the sister inherited not just Doc's letters that he sent to her, but when he died, his belongings were sent back to Atlanta to the family. But because she was a nun, there was, they were, the family was terrified of scandal because they were a pretty high ranking family in Atlanta. And Atlanta society was very conservative. And so she didn't. She couldn't go down to the railroad station to pick up his belongings. She had to have her her father do that, uh, Doc Holliday's uncle. And so he did. So she inherited all of his, you know, her letters to him as well. So she had the entire correspondence for a while. And for some reason, some of the letters that she considered not as private as some of the others, she actually gave to one of her uh, cousins to take care of, and they would actually read them on Sundays aloud, because apparently Doc was quite the raconteur and told great stories about the West and so on and so forth. Um, but then the aunt who was in charge of them went into a home, and when she came back, she demanded the letters be returned, and she burned them because Sister Melanie had also burned her letters. And she decided that, well, if those letters should were destroyed, so should these. And the premise of the book is, well, what if that's all a lie? What if the letters weren't destroyed? But they said they were under the pretense that, you know, once this generation passes away and they will not be scandalized by what's in these letters, um, maybe then they can be released. And Sister Melanie in particular felt that if people could have read, read, read those letters, his reputation would have been much different in the public eye because he showed a side of himself in those letters he never showed to anyone else. So with something that juicy and fascinating, how can you not run with it? So, so I did, and I made, I had a sort of a double story where the letters kind of, I, I provide some of the letters. And one of the best compliments I got was from my agent at the time who said, where did you find these letters? I said, I wrote them. You know, and I just assumed the personality of her and him and wrote these intimate love letters to each other, coursing their relationship from when he first leaves and uh, to when he find, oh, is, is on his deathbed. And those provide sort of the, the subtext to what's actually going on in the main story between the main characters. Some people didn't pick up on that. I mean, I, I tried not to make it too obvious, you know, I just, so it's more like, well, you hear some action, then here's a letter, and then 
here's you know some action and here's a letter you know this is what they're fighting over because the whole issue is well if they exist how valuable would they be and to whom it turns out they would be valuable to a certain character who proves to be who proves to want them for uh, rather nefarious ends Ooh. and to um trying to recover them once he gains possession of them is the main action of the story. Well, we got a lot of action to talk about, David. We've got Margaret Mitchell, a friend of the Holiday family, basing her her character, the infamous Melanie, on Doc Holiday's real life cousin, Melanie, who became a nun. We've got secret letters. We've got burning letters. We've got a lot to talk about. And we're going to get into every single delicious, dirty detail of it. Those are just the letters. That, that now, to get into the action of the story, Ooh. the main character is a lawyer who is... Um, has been working with a man whose name is uh, Chuck Mercer. Ooh. And he is known as the man who forged the West. He was a rodeo writer and a sketch artist at the age of 18, fell in love with a girl who was 16, decided to show off for her at a rodeo, got on a bull he never should have ridden, had a devastating accident that almost killed him. The girl's family, she was wealthy, scooted her away to make sure she never had contact with him again. Once he recovered, he could never ride again. So he goes to Los Angeles, works in a renovation studio where they, you know, they take paintings from museums and touch them up or um, do the kind of work that you need to do to make something. So if, if, if it's been damaged in any way, you can repair it. And what these guys do is they learn, you know, everything about what type of canvas was used, what type of poster board was used, what kind of oils were available, what kind of uh, pigments were available, which ones weren't. One of the great things that uh, a forger did um, to mimic an old painting that had been stored away, for example, maybe in a barn and nobody knew what it was, is very often when that happens, there's little dark droplets in the corners and those are fly droppings. And he found a way to mix an adhesive with a, with a sort of sepia dye that he could drop into the corners. And then you also have to make sure that if, if, if the painting has been in a frame for a long time, you have to be able to mimic the difference in the backing from what's underneath the frame and not. There's all these subtle things that go into framing. So this guy got really, really good at it. And he decided to do Western art because there was the, the, what they call the Bling Dynasty, and I love that term. It's the Nouveau Reach in China. And um, they were just obsessed with American culture and in particular American Western paintings. And so he begins to feed this market with the help of a, a corrupt dealer that he knows. Uh, goes great guns um, and for about eight years and then he gets caught. The dealer absconds to no one knows where. And once he gets out, he decides to go legit and becomes a consultant. And our protagonist, the lawyer, has helped him get that business on his legs. He's helped arrange, you know, his contracts. He's helped, you know, arrange for his own estate plan. He's, you know, been basically been a liaison with some of the uh, the people who who want his services, you know, galleries, foundations, museums, that kind of thing. And so they're very close. And he's a he's about in his 40s. She's in her late 20s. She has a bit of a crush on him. Hmm. And um, he says, you know, I've I've come into possession of these letters that may or may not be legit, I don't know. And the problem is we'll never be able to confirm it because there's no exigent handwriting to compare them to. So, and the woman who owns them is really quite poor. She'd like a quick turnaround. And there are some people who don't really care if they're verified or not. They'll say, yeah, I'd love to have the, you know, the love letters of Doc Holiday, and I can just show them to my friends at cocktail parties. And you know that, and 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 she could really use that money. And if you can arrange the sale, I think we've got a buyer um, who'd be interested. And he's a judge down in Arizona, down in that same area, Tucson, where Doc was famous. Um, if you could go down with the with the owner of the letters and arrange the sale, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. It would be best if I wasn't involved, because with a background as a forger, it would just darken, you know, dirty the waters. So she does that and, well, just say that things go south really quickly and then she's got to try to make amends. And meanwhile, the owner, the girl, has a boyfriend who's an ex-Marine you know, whose face has been half burned from a, from a 
an accident in Iraq. And where he comes from, if somebody steals something from it, you steal it back. You don't go to lawyers. So she, he assembles a little squad of his friends to go get the letters back one way or another, while our lawyer is trying to do it the legit way. And those, so all of this is kind of colliding at once. So it's, it was kind of fun to write. Super fun. And I can't wait to hear more about it. But first, I just want to welcome everyone who's joining us on YouTube, on Facebook, Murder by the Book, my channels um, in the Mystery and Thriller Maven Facebook group, wherever you're logging on from, you're in the right place. This is the right time. And this is your time to ask David anything. So get your questions going in the comments and I'll get them right over to him. Leslie saying hello from Canada. That's her signature. Hello, Canadian. Hello, Leslie. Welcome. Always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. I want to welcome Tara. I want to welcome Christine, Sheila, Michelle, Debbie, uh, Irma, Dana, Leslie, again, another Leslie, Kim, uh, Debbie, Paula, and Carol. So great to have you all. Let us know what questions you have for David. I see they're already starting to come in. This one from Debbie. She'd like to know, how did you research what the letters were about and what types of things he wrote? Let's get into the research. Well, the research was um, basically based just on Doc and his life. There's a new bio, not a new biography, it came out about, I think, 2004, but it's the definitive biography. Before then, the biographies were either novelistic, to be kind, or were just based on folklore and um, were not really rooted in scholarship. But starting in the late 1990s, a whole new breed of historians really began to look at the Wyatt Earp Doc Holliday, Tucson, um, and in particular, the, the shootout at the OK Corral, um, that whole world. And it was a fascinating world, in particular, because it had a lot of carryovers from the Civil War. And Doc was a boy in the Civil War and uh, very much resented what happened to the South. But he had to leave the South. And that in itself is a, is a great story. I mean, there are people said, well, he left for his health because he had tuberculosis. Well, the truth of the matter is he could have gone a number of places in the South where they had, you know, healing waters, springs of that sort, um, which was very common at the time, but he didn't. Instead, he went to Dallas. And if you were trying to recover from tuberculosis for your health, Dallas was probably the last place you would go. It was no improvement in weather. It was a pigsty. They actually used pigs to clean up the horse manure in the streets. There'd been a yellow fever outbreak a mere months before he arrived. Doc went to Dallas to dry out. He uh, joined a temperance society. He uh, worked with a, a very staunch Baptist friend of his father's, was trying to become, and started a dentistry practice, and was basically trying to go legit. And it was what I believe is that there's something happened in Georgia that made him want to leave. Now, what might that have been? Some people say there was probably a scandal, and there was. Uh, there was a watering hole on his uncle's property. Uh, some black youths were swimming in it. He apparently didn't like that and took a pot shot at them. And depending on who you believe, he either shot over their heads, um, he murdered them all, or he wounded a couple in the back. There's no contemporaneous newspapers that mention this incident, but it's very much a part of family lore. Many people think that he let was scooted out of town to avoid any prosecution. But if there was going to be a prosecution, especially given the prominence of his father, who was the head of the Freedmen's Bureau, it would have become known. So, but he was also gambling. Uh, he had made friends with a notorious gambler in Atlanta. He may have run up significant debts and couldn't pay them. But what he himself said once um, to a, the son of the governor of the New Mexico territory was that a woman had broken his heart. He had been jilted and he'd never gotten over it. And that's why he left. And that was what Bat Masterson said when he wrote his own recollection of Doc's life. So I began thinking, well, what if it was, what if he, that his heart was broken by Maddie. Her name was uh, Maddie Holiday. Sister Melanie was the name she chose as a nun. And that's interesting in and of itself, because Melanie uh, married her first cousin, the the woman uh, that became Ashley Wilkes. Yeah, Ashley Wilkes. 
Right. Mm-hmm. And, Mel- and, and exactly. Very and interesting. Thousand. And so were Doc and Maddie. However, in the Catholic Church, to which Maddie belonged, because she was part of the Fitzgerald side of the family, very Irish Catholic, um, you cannot marry a first cousin. Now, Doc might have wanted to marry her and thinking that maybe she would convert because his mother converted on her deathbed. And he was very attached to his mother, um, very estranged from his father, especially after the mother died because the father married within three months to a very much younger woman who lived just down the road. And that in itself was a scandal. But And Doc never forgave him for that because Doc, nursed his mother throughout her illness. She had tuberculosis. That's likely where he caught it, but they didn't know it was contagious back then. It was several decades until they found out that TB was contagious or consumption as they called it at the time. So Maddie uh, is Catholic. He thinks she might convert because on her deathbed, his mother converted from Presbyterianism, which was his father's faith, back to her the faith of her youth, which is Methodism, Episcopalianism, which is far more forward thinking. Presbyterianism, especially the old Scott Irish kind, very much believes in predestination. I mean, you are damned or not from birth. You have no choice in it. Nothing you do is going to make any difference. And she believed instead that no, what he did in his life mattered. She wanted him to believe that. And she converted on her deathbed to convince him no, what you do in your life will matter. The phrase was deeds, not creeds that Methodists would use for this. So, I mean, his mother converted for him. Why wouldn't Maddie? But Catholic, no. I mean, she was devoutly Catholic as her mother was. And um, so my belief was that what I wrote into the letters was that he had proposed, she had refused on, on, on faith grounds. And so he decided to leave thinking that if he left, she would miss him enough that she would change her mind. Because when you look at love letters from that area, and that's something else I researched, this was the first time in American and probably Western history when courtship wasn't controlled by parents. And the young adults conducted their own courtship on their own terms. Well, for a woman, that could be really dangerous. And so a lot of the love letters at the time really concerned proof of love. You know, prove to me that you love me and not that you're just going to use me and abuse me and I'm going to be left high and dry. We're going to have a bunch of kids and then you go do what you want and I'm stuck. Well, what if that went both ways? What if Doc wanted a proof of life? I mean, proof of love, not proof of life. <laughs> Saying that, you know, well, if you know, if you love me, Come be with me. Let's get away from the South. Get away from Georgia. Get away from everybody who thinks they know us. Live with me, and maybe we can make a future for each other. And she did a proof of love, saying, well, if you love me, you'll come back to the family that loves you, because you're going to need us. You know, you're going to need the circle of your family to care for you, because, you know, we, your illness is serious. Most people didn't live past 40. I mean, Chopin didn't. And, um, and and it was it was considered a disease of the artistic. You know, the Brown, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning died of it. Chopin died of it. Um, it was famous among European intellectuals. So um, that was basically my setup on that's what the letters would be about at first. And and she would constantly be urging him to come back. He would be constantly urging her to join him. And then she would begin learning through newspaper reports or through gossip. There were actually people from Georgia who knew him in the West who probably sent word back to the family, well, this is, you know, what we know is going on, uh, who could tell them, for example, that he was living with a woman, which would not sit well with Maddie, given all these implorings for her to join him. And there were rumors that they were actually married. That was not the case. And so... This relationship of proof of love and then estrangement and then reconciliation, but then ultimately she gave up and she joined the convent. And what prompted her to do that? At one point, he was mortally wounded and they sent a family member. He was hoping it would be her. 
but they didn't want to send a, you know, a woman to the West alone. So instead they sent a, a, a one of her, I think her younger brother, who had been in the Civil War as a cadet, who they felt could take care of himself. And he came out to take care of Doc in New Mexico, where he had been shot. So with all of that intrigue, there was plenty to write about. The problem was not letting the letters overwhelm the story and selecting just enough to put in to be interesting, to, to show the reader why they would be fascinating to somebody and to provide a little, and it, it's sort of hard to explain how that provides backstory to the main story without giving some of the ghost away. But So let's talk, let's get back to, to Debbie's question about your actual research. So you read these biographies, some which were novelistic, then in the 90s became more uh, research-based. Did you, you know, did you travel to the OK Corral? Did you go to his okay. birthplace? Did okay. you, you know, tell us, bring us into your research process? OK, well, um, I, I'm a firm believer. I mean, I know a lot of people say, well, you've got to go there and you've got to be there. And uh, there are definitely some benefits. But remember that whatever you're doing, you're going to be translating into language. Mm. And this whole notion that has come about in the last 12 years, that somehow researching from books is somehow inferior to be actually going there. Mm. I don't know. Books actually show you how to convey that information in words. Mm. So I'm not a a belittler of book research. I studied acting when I was younger. In fact, that's where I learned how to write um, by studying playwrights. And I, it was Stella Adler once who was talking, she was trying to teach these uh, students who were basically, they, they weren't being active enough in a scene. They were like talking. She goes, when actors talk in a scene, like so let's say it's Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> they're talking ideas. This is why Writers spend so much time in the library. And it was there was one of those moments where I realized that's right. You know, writers spend time in the library. That is their job. Now, on top of that, though, on top of the, the, the written research I did, I will say, though, that one of the things I tracked down, and I mean, there was a lot of stuff I tracked down that was mentioned in the footnotes of the biography I read. And one was one little booklet that had a section on the, the Holiday family written by Maddie. And it, I used, I, I wanted to see it. I wanted to see what her prose style was like. I didn't care for her prose style. <laughs> so I invented my own for her. What, what did you not care about it? It was just sort of, it. it wasn't literary. It wasn't, I expected her to be a little bit more educated. It was very plain spoken. It may have been just something she jotted down without thinking a lot about it. And it certainly wasn't for publication. It was just for within the family. Um, and I just thought, I want to, especially in a love letter, I wanted to be a little bit more, not florid, but certainly a little bit more lyrical, a little more musical in the language. Um, and Doc had never, we, we don't know of any extant writing from Doc, um, though he was quoted in a, um, a New York newspaper. He was interviewed at length by one guy. But the problem, of course, then is, Newspaper reporters were notorious for making stuff up. And God only knows how much of that was actually what Doc said and how much it wasn't. So I didn't really, you know, rely much on that either. I just, I, I developed a language and a voice for each of them based on what I knew about them and their life. And I just trusted that. I love that. Debbie, thank you for the great question. Uh, David, thank you for the extensive answer. And clearly it worked for some reporters who we now believe uh, do not just go around making stuff up. Patrick Anderson of the of the Boston, of the Washington Post raving that this book is the best in contemporary crime fiction, or if I may be so bold, in contemporary fiction, period. Actually, he didn't, he didn't say that about this book. Okay, that it was listed under that book, David. <laughs> he said that about my second novel, Done for a Dime. Okay, I I am I am a thorough researcher myself. That mm -hmm. is listed under this book. But let's talk about the tools because as a as a writer, as a creator of prose of stories that earn this kind of praise, what, from a craft perspective, what do you think? What do you think your your top three tips are? What are your what is the secret to writing? great contemporary fiction. Character, character, character. It, it, it really gets down to um, 
that. I mean, I've written two books about writing, The Art of Character and The Compass of Character. It's sort of um, an obsession of mine. And um, I, I teach a course through Lit Reactor called uh, The Character of Plot. And it's all about how to create characters who are fascinating and complex enough that they can generate the story that you're hoping to tell rather than have you think what the story is and just insert them in like plot puppets. So that's, you know, and so my, you know, I, I believe that um, the character drives story completely. Um, the other thing I say is you, you can't fake voice. And mm. that's that sort of, if you either have it or you don't. Um, though there are books um, and, uh, on how to develop a strong voice, the best technique I ever heard was from uh, Jim Fry, who said what he would, when he had a student who was like a good storyteller, but their, their voice wasn't strong, their language wasn't, wasn't riveting, he'd say, you know, pick a writer that you love, and in particular, a, a, a writer that made you want to write. I love the Saul Bellow quote. Uh, writers are readers inspired to emulation. And for example, uh, Lehane said that it was Richard Price, and in particular, The Wanderers, that he said, you know, he's writing about a world that I know. And that book made me think that maybe I can do this. And Richard Price remains like a, a god to Dennis Lehane. He said that uh, the, the, the greatest day of his life when he got to drive Richard Price around Boston was even more than when he, even greater than when he met Clint Eastwood when they were filming. <laughs> Uh, Mr. River. I love that. And so, you know, I, I what what Jim would say is take a writer that that you admire, and for a half an hour every day before you start writing, type out word for word, comma by comma, period by period. You know, for half an hour, one of those books that you admire. Now, your fear will be that you'll become derivative, and he said the, tr the weird, tricky thing is you won't. But what will happen is. The part of your mind that is a reader that enjoys that language will begin connecting with that physical part of your brain, which types out words, which you're doing, and you'll begin sort of just naturally beginning to use a stronger language in your own writing. And he says, I don't know why this works, but I've had a, I, I had a, a, a writer buddy who just passed away um, at the age of 90, and that was how he taught himself to write. He typed out um, crime and punishment word for word. I mean, that's, it sounds nuts. Wow. Yeah. Typing out crime and punishment word for word must have taken <laughs> quite a number of years. I know. Uh, but you know, that, uh, Floyd was nothing if not obsessive. And, uh, but he had that kind of, that, you know, and he was a boxer. And that combined with that sort of Dostoevskyan mentality was really what defined his voice. So voice is something that you, you can't fake, but you can learn. A character is most important. And the other thing is um, that great line by Elmore Leonard, which is try not to write the parts that people tend to skip, by which he meant description. Um, he didn't mean it categorically. He actually, in, in the essay where he expands on this, he mentions that I think it's Sweet Thursday by Steinbeck. There's one chapter called um, Something Doodle. I can't remember the, the first part of it. But it's like he took all the long descriptive passages that he normally put in one of his longer novels and he just put it in that chapter. And uh, in case you wanted to skip that part. And Leonard said, of course, I read that chapter. I read every word. It was beautiful. So he's, it, it, But what's happened is because of the world we live in, the era of movies and everything moving at 90 miles an hour and the internet, People's attention span have just diminished. And you're constantly fighting for the reader's attention. And I just went through, I wrote a blog post about this. I, I, I contribute to the Writer Unboxed, which is a wonderful blog on the, uh, the business and the craft of writing. And I said, you know, murdering 22,000 darlings. I, um, I cut 22,000 words from a manuscript that I had an editor consider really quite good. But I just went through and I said, you know what? It's still not tight enough. And you have to develop a sense of when you're repeating yourself. You have to develop a sense of where, no, the reader's ahead of me. And, and that really is you have to develop the ability to read your own work like a reader who's never seen it before. Sometimes you have to put it away for a while before you can do that. Sometimes you just have to be 
merciless. But those three things, learning how to read your work as a, as a reader, not as the writer, and therefore get rid of all the redundancies and the repetition that you don't even see. Because a lot of times when you're writing, you're building up momentum. And you're just, you're sort of riding a wave. You don't, you don't see then that you're actually creating more than you need because it's just part of the wave that you're riding. It takes going back and going, you know, I said it really well that one time. And yeah, that's a great phrase, but it's got to go because that one is the one that nailed it. Ooh. And, you know, and dialogue. Very often you have characters responding to another, you know, and it becomes sort of like verbal tennis and going, no, skip to the next important thing said. The reader will fill in all that chatter, get rid of that. And so learning to you know, read your work like a writer, the importance of your own voice and developing it in character. Those would be the three things that I'd say are really key to writing a book that other people are going to want to read. Ooh, David Corbett dropping gems over here. And I am loving every single minute of it. Thank you. I feel like this is a masterclass in great writing. Um, very appreciated. Thank you. I'm going to come back and rewatch this again just so I can really soak it in. Um, Leslie would like to know, what are you working on next, David? I'm, um, the, the novel that I cut 22,000 words on, I'm actually reworking it again, um, just to see if I can get into the story quicker. I'm um, again, I'm, I've got an editor friend, uh, Zoe Quinton. She's the daughter of, uh, Laurie King who uh, writes the Mary Robinson mysteries. And uh, Zoe and I have worked on this. She loves the book, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's an odd fit for the market right now. Um, haven't been able to find an agent for it. And so I'm trying to think of, you know, is there anything that is objectively wrong with it? Or is it just either, you know, I'm yesterday's news and no agent, you know, they'd rather have a younger writer, you know, a, a, a more in the buzz of the moment. Or that there's something actually that I can fix about this book to make it more palatable to an agent. And so I just, she said, you know, the only thing I can think of is if you can maybe get into the journey part of the story a little bit quicker. So that's what I'm doing now. And it's going to be part of a trilogy. And the protagonist is a character from Irish myth, uh, Ocean, the son of Finn McCool. And in the old stories, he passes away, usually in the company of St. Patrick which I find interesting. And that's part of the Yeats poem about him, the wanderings of a Well, what if that, again, what if that isn't what happened? What if something else happened? And I create another story for him and that instead he's been cursed to live and die over and over and over again until he learns the wisdom of all the world. And it turns out that that curse is a trick. And so he's now been, re you know, basically born and died again, born and died again to the point where he's, you know, he could easily be cynical about humanity. Um, he's tried being the perfect him. That didn't work. He tried being, you know, discovering his shadow side, his evil side. That didn't work. He decided to just keep committing suicide over and over again, you know, and you get back to um, his bride, who's in the other world. Um as quickly as possible. And that got nixed pretty quick. And so now he just says, okay, what am I doing here? And he's ultimately decided, well, you know, I'm a warrior and better I fight than some young man who doesn't know what he's getting into, or maybe I can help them. And then maybe there's someone he meets that inspires him to saying, this person is too fragile for this world and they need a protector. So that's what I'll do. And that's what the first book is about. He finds a, a young woman who's just a genius, but she's psychologically troubled. She suffers from severe depression. She gets abused terribly by one of her teachers who steals her masterpiece and becomes famous. Mm. And he tries to help her get it back. And that's happening as America is descending into civil war. So that's that book. And the follow-up is a few years further on, America is now a bunch of enclaves of city-states some of which are run by corporations, some of which are run by mafias. Yikes. And he again finds somebody worth protecting. In this case, a, a, a woman doctor in the ghetto who uh, refuses to go along with the either the organized crime running her ghetto or the corporate biotech concerns that run medicine outside the wall. And he decides to see if he can help her 
help her patients a little better than she can, given her morals, her scruples. Like a lot of the kids have rickets, the disease that kids shouldn't have. But if you don't mm. have D, if the skies are that weird color of orange like they were in San Francisco, if that's permanent, mm. and if they're not getting the nutrition they need from their food, diseases we think we've conquered are going to come back in, in a huge way. So that's the other thing I'm working on. Very cool. Thank you for the great question, Leslie. Thank you for the inside scoop. David, Margaret Pinar joining us from the Pacific Northwest saying, hey, I know Writer Unbox and they are great. Um, yes, a wonderful research there, a uh, wonderful resource there. I just plopped the link into uh, the comments of David, the link to David's article on um, murdering 22,000 darlings, how he cut 22,000 words from a book his editor said was already really tight and good. So there is that article. If anyone wants to check it out, there it is. Margaret saying, Oi, and I'm probably going to pronounce this right or pronounce this wrong. Oisin and Finn McCool. Now you're talking my language here, David. Margaret loves uh, and specializes in historical fiction in uh Scotland, Ireland, and England, I believe, Margaret, am I getting that right? Let me know in the comments. Um, just making sure I didn't miss anything. She's saying also fighting for the reader's attention. Boy, howdy. Um, absolutely. It is. And, and our attention spans just keep getting shorter and shorter. And when you think they cannot possibly get any shorter, then TikTok comes on, <laughs> it comes on board and, and, and turns them even more. Um, so all of this, such great um, such great fodder for, for discussion. Thank you for that. Um, Margaret saying I got her genre, her genre close enough. Listen, I know it's somewhere over there in the England, in the English region, Margaret. Um, David, well, another it's, fabulous it's, review. It's was, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's Celtic. So it's going to be Ireland, Wales, um, Scotland. It won't be England. Okay, great. Thank you for letting okay. me know. Unless you're, the Arthurian romances were Celtic. There's a, there again, a really fascinating story that, you know, England always looked back to Arthur as, the royalty looked back to Arthur as part of their lineage mm. until Henry VIII, when he broke away from Catholicism. Oh, yes. And Celtic, you know, that was Irish. That was going to be Catholic or Scottish. You know, Mary was, you know, Scottish. Those were the Catholic realms. So that's when they began looking back to their Anglo-Saxon past instead. Mm. And I'll start with Henry VIII and with the uh, with his rift with the Catholic Church. So Henry the I have read so many books about the fascinating reign of Henry VIII um, and his six wives. It, it, I, I just I cannot get enough of that. There's something so interesting about it. Um, so David, for 15 years, you worked as a private investigator in San Francisco at the firm of Palladino and Sutherland. What was that like? How has it informed your writing? How has it impacted your writing? Well, I was with, it's a story. Okay. So <laughs> I was studying acting at the time. And like I said, that's pretty much where I learned how to write. I didn't study English in college. Mm -hmm. I was a math major. So I had really took very few English courses and I didn't take any writing courses. Uh, I was a musician. I was in a bar band. <laughs> you know, I wrote some poems and wrote some songs and had, but began writing stories as I was studying acting and was trying to figure out which way to go. And two friends in my acting class said they were working for this private investigation firm in San Francisco, Paladino and Sunland. And they said, well, if you want to write, you ought to get a job here because you can't beat this place for, for material. And so I applied. It took me nine months to get them to hire me. They hired me because they said I was the most persistent applicant they had ever had. And at my three-month review, Jack Palladino, uh, my boss, said, you know, we figured you'd be like good at the writing stuff, but we didn't think you'd really get into it as much as you did. And I just did. I got into it. The job was fascinating. It was... Um, it was just, you know, get the story and going out and talking to people. And I just, that's a skill you can't really teach. Either you're good at getting people to talk to you or you're not. And it's whether people trust you or not and getting them to trust you. And, and I just happened to have the gift. Why? I don't know. But, and so I did that because I enjoyed it. But I, I sat there and I thought, well, okay, this is going to be a really consuming job. This isn't something I'm going to be able to phone in. So I thought of it that these will be my years at sea. 
and I'll write about them like Melville wrote about his, you know, you know, life as a merchant seaman. Um, and that's where my material come from. And that's certainly, that was certainly true for the first few books. And um, the first book in particular was based on a series of cases we had involving a group of marijuana smugglers in San Diego called the Coronado Company. Um, they were basically Navy brats. Coronado was a naval base. So there were sons and cousins and everything of, of naval commanders. Uh, they were also the coolest kids in high school. You know, they, they, they had the boats, you know, and they, they'd go across the Tijuana, score some pot, swim it across the border, show up at the party, and they were just, they were just so hip. Well, the, the, the loads got bigger and bigger to the point where somebody needed to speak Spanish. So they recruited their high school Spanish teacher into the group. His name was Lou Villar. He ended up betraying them. He ended up turning on them and snitching against them, saying that they corrupted him. And I'll let you judge on how much I, you think I believe that. But they were not just these Navy brats. This is also when the Vietnam War was ending and all these Vietnam vets were coming back. And the whole idea of you know working at Kinko's or working a job after you know being in a combat zone just wasn't cutting it. But wow, bringing in marijuana and they had connections in Bangkok. So hey, these guys would like go to Southeast Asia, buy a boat. They had enough money to just buy a boat, refix it, hire a crew, load it up, bring it across the Pacific, you know, park it about, you know, how many miles offshore, send the Zodiacs out from the beach, load the Zodiacs, bring it in, break it down, take it to the, uh, the warehouse, break it down some more for the various distributors, truck it away. And it was just, it was fun. These guys were wild, but they weren't evil. And um, that's who we were like working with when I first started. And they were, they were real characters and, and fascinating guys. And in particular, my protagonist, the first book, Danny Epitangelo, was based on one of the guys in the Coronado Company. And, um, but about 1988, I went to my boss and I said, you know, we're not getting the kind of clients we used to because Reagan had come in. All these guys, by the way, this is the 70s. And they thought they were going to become the Joe Kennedy's pot. You know, it's just like, it's going to get legalized any day now. You know, once Carter gets in, we're cool. It's going to be great. You know, we're going to have that. We're going to be on, on the ground floor. We're going to be millionaires. Didn't happen. Reagan comes in, declares war on marijuana as a gateway drug. Um, and who are you going to go after? You go after the guys who are easiest to catch. And that was these guys because they weren't dangerous. Within five to 10 years, organized crime had completely taken over the marijuana trade. And I told my boss, I said, you know, we're just not seeing the kind of clients we used to. And he goes, oh, if those guys were still in the business, they'd be betrayed or dead. And that was the idea for my first book. <laughs> what if a guy took a fall for his crew? He gets 10 years. They call it a hard 10. He serves every day of his 10-year sentence. So that they'll all get three. And in particular, his girlfriend is one of them. And when he gets out, even though he's not supposed to have contact with any convicted felons, He's hell-bent on finding her because he, he thinks she's in trouble because she stopped writing to him. And it was just weird. Mm. And, and, of course, classic noir setup, instead of getting her out of trouble, he gets sucked into her trouble. And that's what that book's about. And oh so that's about the PI work filtered into, you know, my fiction writing at that time. I got enough. Let her story, though. My boss, Jack Palladino, died this past year. He solved his own murder. He was uh, he was retired now, and he was really getting into photography. He was had a lifelong love of photography, and uh, one one day he heard some racket outside his house. He lived uh, on the edges of the Hay Dash Ferry, in his, the old I Magnon Mansion, and he hears this noise. So he grabs his camera, typical Jack, goes out with his camera, and he sees these two guys breaking into cars. So he begins photographing them, and they jump into a car, and he keeps photographing. And they come near him and he just stands there, keep photographing. And they reach out, they grab the camera and try to pull the camera away from it. Instead, it's around his neck. They pulled it to the ground with such force. He has a terrible concussion that, from which he never recovered. He died in a coma. But the police were able to use the camera to identify the two guys, arrested them, and now they're being tried for his, his murder. Oh my gosh, that is crazy. Isn't that an amazing story? And it's so Jack. I mean, it, it, it's just, uh, I, I, I love telling that story. And it's just so true to who he was. 
Wow. You don't hear solved your own murder every day. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, David, you have been an incredible and entertaining and informative guest. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to remind everyone to grab uh, Margaret saying, wow, that is an intense way to go. Margaret, I, my thoughts exactly. Um, grab all of David's books tonight. I'm plopping the link to the comments, right? Link to his books, his backlist right here in the comments. And you can also grab the long lost love letters of Doc Holliday um, as well. I'm going to put the link to that one in there so you can grab them all. Um, so if you're interested in the craft of writing, grab um, David's books on craft. And if you're interested in those love letters, uh, grab that one as well. Grab them all. Um, David, thank you so much for coming on. It has been such a delight to have you and to learn from you. And uh, we will look forward to seeing these next books out in the world and coming back to tell us about those. That'd be great. Sarah, thank you so much for having me. This is really fun fun. It's a pleasure. All right, everybody. I will see you at the top of the hour with LA Times crime reporter turned thriller author, James Queely, aka Jay Quizzical. Stay tuned and we will see you then.